everyone, it is George Kroos and welcome back to another highlight video from the month of July 2023 from the Innovators Mindset podcast. And before I get to my wonderful guests, I always like to share a little message. And I'll tell you this week was really strange for me because it had some great highlights and it had some really rough times and what really helped me get through it was this video I want to share with you uh, from Olympian Alexi Pappas talking about the rule of thirds. So my my Olympic coach told me after a particularly challenging workout where I could not hit my splits before going to the Rio Olympics that that was okay it was the rule of thirds and he was an Olympian so I was you know, I always soaked in everything he said. And I was like, what's what's the rule of thirds? And he said, when you're chasing a dream or doing anything hard, you're meant to feel good a third of the time, okay a third of the time, and crappy a third of the time. And if the ratio is roughly in that range, then you're doing fine. So today was the crappy day along your dream chasing. Right. And if the ratio is off, like you feel too good all the time or too bad, then you you got to look at if you're fatiguing or, or not trying hard enough or pushing yourself. So why I love that video is because of the idea that you're chasing dreams, that you're really trying to achieve something. And sometimes I feel when I am not exhausted, when I'm not pushing myself, that I haven't really done enough. And then there's... The other times where I am feeling just everything's going really well, that I'm missing something that I I, I really should uh, be doing more. And to put that in perspective, when I thought about Alexi sharing that idea of the rule of thirds, it really kind of helped me get through this week to look at like, hey, this this great thing that happened that I'm really a, a pumped up this is awesome. This is part of the work that I've been doing for a long time. But this thing that I struggle with, this is also part of the work. And the thing that I appreciate about this, in education, we are focused on becoming learning organizations. And I've often shared that learning is really messy. And I've shared this image before of Dimitri Martin, where he talks about what success actually looks like it's not linear it's not a straight trajectory and it reminds me of a quote that i absolutely love that it takes years and years of hard work to become an overnight success and the reason i love that quote so much is because we too often focus on the end product of what we see how someone you know where someone is at today but we don't actually appreciate the ups and downs of the process And so if you're struggling, if you're having a rough time, but you're also having, you know, some big wins in your life, kind of synthesizing and putting that together, that that idea of the rule of thirds, as long as you're growing from that process, I find that helps me put things into perspective. So instead of being really frustrated when I had a rough time this week, I thought about Alexi, I thought about the idea of the rule of thirds and what she had learned from her coach. And I apply that to my own life saying like, look, right now, today sucks, it's going to get better. Or saying, hey, today was awesome, but maybe I need to push myself a little bit more to have some of those rough spots because only through that messiness is that where we grow. So I just love that video. It really helped me. So I wanted to share it all with you. But if that wasn't enough, you're going to see some amazing guests uh, from this past month on the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Thank you for being here. What, yeah. what did you find is like when you transitioned from high school to middle school, what yeah. was like, what was like, was it, what was like one of the biggest changes for you going through that process? So I grew up thinking that it would be high school and I'd be the high school coach and that was it. And yeah. I thought that I could relate to those people. So those kids, and I did. However, when I got to middle school, I would always say two things. I would always say that middle school is the last best chance for a kid. And the reason why I say that is, is because if you look at the adolescent developmental structure of a child, they usually go into, let's say, sixth grade, where their moms and dads and their significant others and their guardians want them to still be friends with everybody. So sixth grade is I'm friends with everybody. 
You then get into seventh grade. You start to develop your own identity. You start to say, maybe I like these kids better than those kids, or maybe those kids are bad and mean, and I don't want to sit with them. So you right. start to struggle. And then when you get to eighth grade, you usually have your well-defined friend group, and then there's only infighting with them. But by the time you leave 14 years old, about when you leave eighth grade, you have all those qualities that make you usually who you are, and they're pretty much solidified. So the role of the middle school educator, the role of adults in middle school is to make sure kids always have an adult they can talk to, is to make sure you guide them through the adolescent changes, but it's also to try to instill in them the things like personal responsibility, respect, caring, and all of those pieces and how to work together so that as they get older, that can already be embedded. And then in the high school, you improve upon what you have. Like I never, a lot of times I didn't stress the pure academics of it, although obviously Massachusetts we right. do, but it was more about the connections and the self-identity so that when they leave your school in eighth grade, they have the skills necessary to become individuals who can think, who can act, who can be respectful, and then who can learn along the way because they have those inherent skills already. One of the things you talked about um, when we were kind of prepping for this podcast was, the, and you've kind of mentioned it, the importance of having kids have the opportunity to kind of stick out and share their own story. And you actually shared something about your you're a twin. And yes. that's part of that. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And, yeah, yeah, and oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, it's interesting because I, as you know, I did a TEDx talk and I wove my whole story about being a twin into personal branding because there is no doubt that it shaped my quest um, to to work on my own personal brand, but also to to help others. This, if you think about it, like growing up as a twin has its challenges. You know, constant comparisons. Stacy, you know, like why do you weigh more than your twin? Hmm. What you know? Why does she get better grades than you? And I remember having one aunt that I don't even think that she knew our names. We were just like known as the twins. Yeah. And of course, you know, we shared a room, we had twin beds until we were 16. So I always wanted to be unique and memorable. And that's what personal branding is, is about. And really the biggest compliment that someone could give me growing up was like, Stacy, you are so unique. Mm -hmm. So again, I have, and I feel like it's a gift. Like I know how to package things. It doesn't matter if it's a product. It doesn't matter if it's a service or a person. I want to crystallize the, um, like their uniqueness. Like what, because there's a misconception, right? Personal branding, a lot of people think it's like narcissistic. It's like me, me, me. But when it's not, it's really like, what is the value of you to others? What can you contribute to the, the college campus? And so it's, finding again what your value is and why should someone choose you why should you land on the top of an admission officer's pile and the same flows through to if you're looking for an internship or trying to get a scholarship or or a job or even to that matter online dating right i've had right. some single friends like ask me yeah. for their help yeah yeah that that that's a uh... That, that's a really important aspect of this too, because I think um, sometimes there is this, like social media is fake. And you know, you're a certain way when you're offline compared to online. And there there is some truth to that for myself. And the way that I explain it is, for example, do I swear? Of course I swear, I swear terribly, right? Do I swear in social media? No. And the way the way I treat it is, it'd be like me teaching in a classroom. Like I wouldn't swear in front of students. So why would I swear in social media? And it's, it's not about being fake. It's understanding the context, the context yes. of where you are, yes. um, who you're connecting with, and you don't want to lose opportunities before this too. So that's one thing that I try to explain to people. It's there. Yeah. So of course, some people are fake. They're, per, they're portraying something that they really are not, but understanding that people understanding context doesn't mean they're fake, right? Like I share a lot of my ups and downs. I don't know how much you Googled me before. I know we have mutual connections, but like I have struggled with my weight for years and years and I've lost like 120 pounds over the last year. And 
I've shared the struggles I had with that, what I was trying, what I was doing. And a lot of people have appreciated that I shared that journey, not just when I found success, but when I was struggling with failure and they connected with me in a different way. And I would have those same conversations with my students. And that's what makes us real and relatable. And I think that's a really important aspect. And one of the things that you said, and I love this, you said, here's like a four word quote. And I wrote it down as soon as you said, um, add value, not clutter. What do you mean by that? And I love, I, I take a, I have a perception of what that means. What's your, what, what do you mean by that when you share that? Yes. And I will answer that in a second, but I just want to tell you that I, personal branding is about being authentic and real. And I love vulnerability. I think we can show the weaker parts of, of ourselves. It, it makes us, makes us all real and we all have our own struggles. So thank you for sharing that. So add value, not clutter. That is, that is definitely my mantra. It is, there is so much clutter out there and people just turn off to it. And a lot of people will, will post, for example, on social media just to make sure that they get their one post in a day. But no, I'd rather see someone post valuable content that their audience is going to relate to. So we've all heard the term return on investment. But I like to use the term return on engagement, right? Because what you want at the end of the day is you want people to to see your content. You want to make it real, you want to make it relatable, and you, and you want to strike up a conversation. That's what social media is. It's a two-way exchange. And I think when I think when people are just adding posts just to just to feed the you know the content beast, it's just it's worthless. It's it's a waste of time because it's like you've got to make every word count right? You've got to make every word count. And you have to like, even think about like all of your different touch points. I even tell kids, by the way, George, that like even your email signature is, it's mm -hmm. priceless real estate. As you're sending it out to admission officers or alumni, put something there about yourself. Maybe, you know, put in a, a link to a video or, or maybe create a tagline for yourself. So, so again, I, I, it's, it's like, I guess also as, as a news junkie, because I'm in the media, but I've also been in the media. Uh, wait, I'm in the media, but I also right. am in the media. I also say to people, you've got to be your own news channel. Yeah. And so I look at content with for news value from like zero to 10. So everything we put out there, put it through the who cares test. This is something that I've really been focusing on and I've struggled with it in my past that sometimes you get a job as a stepping stone to the next job. Like you always kind of got your, and I, I feel like what you kind of proved is what I've been trying to really shape my mind in is that do what you're doing in the present, the best pot, the best you possibly can. And then opportunities then tend to present themselves like that kind of is like, as I'm listening to you and our conversation, it was just like, Oh, like what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, but but you were just focused on doing your job really well, yep. as opposed to like, Oh, I'm just eyeing that chair. Like, yep. you know, I think sometimes when you eye the chair, that's actually can be a detriment because you're not really doing what you're supposed to be doing as well as you should be. If I were to tell you that this, you know, when I, when I came here that I thought this was my path, I would say, I would have told you, no, this was, right. it was, it was to build capacity and human resources, you know, and, and now that I'm, now that the opportunities present itself, I, yeah. like I said, I, I, it's a pleasure to come to work each and every single day. I it really it. is. And I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. I love it. And Eddie, Eddie, you're just, you're just mentioning this and we were talking a little bit. I know you touched a little bit about it. Uh, what I really appreciate is, so I'm doing, I think I have. 30 or some of these opening days coming up. And <laughs> this is yours is a little bit different in the sense that most of them, they've been done year after year after year. They know exactly where they're going to be. They have their schedule and they're just kind of plugging me into the, the speaker slot, that kind of thing. But yeah, this is new. This is new to you. Like you're like, where are we even doing? <laughs> like you didn't yeah. know where, where you're doing this. You figured out all these logistics. So like, what was the, and I know you kind of touched on this kind of bringing everyone together. Like what, what it ultimately, what's the hope that 
as people walk out of there. And I guess this is kind of, we're, we're getting rid of a meeting by me getting this on the podcast right now. Cause you're going to, I'm going to ask you this anyway. Ab- but absolutely. Yeah, what, yes. what do we hope when people walk out of there that day? Like what's the hope for that? My, my hope is look, I, I think that we need to build relationships here. Not, not just amongst, you know, the hallways, your second grade teacher or, or among departments. Yeah. But Edison is one whole, right. And establishing a culture and an environment that, breed success and and having people enjoy coming to work every single day and and yeah. not being afraid to take risks right in their teaching or their work or whatever they, or whatever they're doing and knowing that we're here to support them right and to to get everybody together to talk about the future of Edison right you know yeah. like like we said previously one of the tenets of great leaders is that they they speak about what great things are to come and yeah. The only way in my mind that we can do that effectively was to get them all together at first. And you're, and you're right, George, I had no clue where I was going to do. I thought about a couple different places and they're like, Eddie, you know, we can fit half of the staff here right. you can do in the morning. I said, no, no, it has to be every member of our organization. Yeah. The buildings will be shut down. I want everyone there. So uh, with a little help from, you know, from our team, Mm-hmm. They found it, and uh, we we knew who, we knew the guy we wanted, right? We, we, knew, we knew who we wanted to kick off, and uh, and I, you know, like I said, I I think that this event will it's it's just going to set a positive tone for not only this year but for years to come, and uh, it, it should be a tradition that we celebrate. We should celebrate people's successes. We should celebrate longevity in the district. Mm-hmm. We should celebrate the acquiring of tenure because it's it it's yeah. tough to get in Edison. It's rigorous. And, you know, like I said, I think the more that we do this, the more we'll build our brand, right? Mm-hmm. Celebrating sure. success, student and staff. So you are, you actually, tomorrow, you yes. are, there's a conference you said that you're yes. going to, and you told me you're presenting yes. on, I think, two different topics. So I, I want to actually ask you about both of them. So one was on AI. You yes. talked about, tell me, tell me about what you're doing with people tomorrow. Cause this is obviously a major conversation that's happening in education right now. Oh, it's, it's huge. What are you talking about um, with your group tomorrow? So our spin on the topic tomorrow is using um, AI as a research superpower Yeah. and using it in a positive way, not in an I gotcha way. Right. right? And if it's introduced in small pieces in all the classes, you know, in low stakes activities like a this or that by showing up some images of AI created things and versus non AI and you know talking about prompt engineering to really get that critical thinking to ask it the best questions so that it can get you started or, you know tone up tone down things that you've already written using it in a way that's good yeah we, there's a this is gonna sound weird there. There is a, there's a South Park episode. <laughs> Isn't this start off great? There's a South Park episode and the, the, the animation is so terrible on South Park oh. <laughs> and it's so minimal that they can actually do stuff that's really relevant and topical yeah. quickly, right? Which is kind of one of the benefits of the, 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 the animation being the way it is. And I'm going to ruin the episode, but they all the kids figure out chat GPT and they started actually using it to do their essays. And so they're just writing these high level essays that are just mind blowing. And the teacher, I think it's Mr. Garrison <laughs> is like, Oh my God, my kids are like writing these essays and I'm like having trouble keeping up. And then uh, basically his partner says like, Hey, have you heard of this chat GPT thing? And so he's using chat GPT to assess the kids, not knowing that they're using GPT <laughs> to actually write the essays. Right. And it's just kind of like, there, there's benefit. And there, there's a video I saw, I can't remember, it's a, um, it's a YouTuber, his name is Minority Mindset. That's what his, uh, it's, I think it's Jasper Singh. He, it's his, his channel is called Minority Mindset. And he talks about um, AI being kind of like a second brain mm-hmm. and seeing it as something that not to overtake and replace the stuff that we're doing, but something that we can utilize to kind of help us in this space. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm actually about in the process of like writing a, a blog post about this. 
there is some benefits of this, but it's also instead of like just jumping and talking about the AI stuff, I think it's really important for our schools or communities to say like, what are the basic things that we need to, to be able to do? Like, for example, if you use chat GPT, uh, you have to know how to read and write. I think that's kind of an important aspect. And that's like a basic skill that every kid should be able to do. Um, but you also have to know how to ask good questions, right? Yes. So th there's, those are elements of that too.